Hey guys, our project for today is to get this old forklift running. It's a Clark UT60D. It's a 6,000 pound capacity all-terrain forklift. It has a little John Deere four-cylinder diesel engine and it's actually in pretty good shape. It's been sitting outside for a long time but we've always kept this tarp over top of the engine and I thought it hadn't run for like up to five years but I talked to my dad today he said he thought he had it running about a year ago so I don't think it'll be too big of a problem to get it going I got the battery charger on it now the problem with this this engine it seems to crank over really slowly and the last time I was down here messing with it I figured out that the ground cable was bad so they had the ground cable connected from the battery here to this bolt on the roll cage and I actually moved the ground cable over here to one of the mounting bolts for the starter and that seems to have really helped our our starter motor to crank the engine over better so I've had the engine cranking over uh, but I just can't get it to run so today we're gonna pop the hood off and see if we can bleed the injector lines this engine does not like ether I know that I tried to squirt a little ether in it the last time I was down here and it just the rings stick to the cylinder walls and she slows down so we're gonna have to try to do it without using ether Okay, it's amazing what an hour of brush cutting can do. Really opens the place up. Should have done that a long time ago. I had to leave these two for now. They're pretty close to the electrical service. So we'll just let that ride. Okay, I got the hood off so we can actually see what we're doing. I think I could do it without the hood being removed, but for the purposes of filming, it'll make it a whole lot easier. So here's our injector lines right here. We just need to crack those loose and spin her over and see what we get. Okay, cool. I got them all to break loose. So last time I was here, the, the lines were wanting to spin around with the nuts. And I just didn't like that. So I hosed them down with some penetrating oil. And it's been, I don't know, a week or so. And they all cracked loose this time. So Okay, we're not getting anywhere. I cranked it and cranked it. Not getting any fuel out. I definitely have fuel coming in. This one, this return line to the pump, can't get that fitting loose because it just wants to spin with the fitting. So I'll just leave it and try to push it up out of the way. We gotta get this cover off again and see what's going on with the metering valve. Okay, well that seems to be moving freely. So I guess that's not our problem. Fuel looks pretty scuzzy. Let's check this solenoid real quick to make sure it's working. Nothing wrong with that. Well, we're going to have to call it a day. The sun's about to go down, and when the sun goes down this time of the year, it's pretty much dark. So, I don't know. There's something I'm missing. I'll come back here another day and see if I can figure it out. Just not getting any fuel up to those injectors. All right, guys. I'm back on this forklift project. I made a little drawing here so we can understand how this Rusenmaster rotary injection pump works. It's not magic. I guarantee you that. These are actually very simple. This is all the stuff basically that's inside of the injection pump housing. And there's a shaft that runs all the way through the thing from one end to the other that's driven off of the timing gears of your engine. So this is your input for the shaft. All these things are going to be rotating together. So the way it works is the fuel comes in the back here. This is your, your inlet from your filters into the pump. And it goes into a small vane style transfer pump at the back. This is going to pump the fuel up to some kind of pressure, let's say 300 PSI. 
And it's going to send it a few different directions, but primarily it's going to go up here to the metering valve. And the metering valve is going to control how much fuel goes into the pumping section of the injection pump. So this is your throttle, basically. So you open the metering valve, and it allows fuel to come in here to this rotary distributor. Now in the rotary distributor, there's a hole on the outside and a hole on the inside. This inside portion is rotating. So as it rotates, the two holes are going to line up. Now there's actually some slots so that there's a little bit of a dwell there. But anyway, as those align, the fuel is going to come in here to the middle of the shaft and it's going to come up here to the pumping section of the injection pump. This is the magic of the rotary injection pump, is these two opposing pistons. So as the fuel comes in, it's going to push those two pistons apart against the outside of this cam ring. Now this whole thing is going to rotate and as soon as it hits these lobes of the cam ring, the two pistons are going to push towards each other and they're going to compress that fuel to a very high pressure. Now the fuel is going to come back out the shaft. It can't go back out this way because these holes here are no longer aligned in the distributor. It's going to go out here to a second distributor. Same deal, there's going to be a hole on the inside and a series of holes on the outside. And when the holes align, that's going to allow the fuel to go into the injection line and out to one of the actual pencil injectors in the engine. So the magical part of these rotary injection pumps is these rotary distributors. And you only need one set of pistons to do all the pumping for all the cylinders. Doesn't matter how many cylinders you have. One, two, four, six, eight. They just change the number of cam lobes that are on this ring and change the number of holes that are in these distributors. Do a little bit of tweaking with the timing and whatnot and you've got as many cylinders as you need. Now there's some other kind of scary magical stuff up here. There's a governor with some weights on the front that control this metering valve to give you constant speed or a maximum speed or minimum speed. And then there's also at the bottom there's a timing advance that acts on this cam ring. It's actually controlled by the pressure of the transfer pump back here. So as the transfer pump spins faster or slower it gives more pressure to that little piston that kind of rotates this ring and that controls your injection timing. So just like any other engine we need the timing to basically advance as the RPMs increase because you know it takes longer for the combustion to happen yada yada. Anyway, not magic, very simple. But what I think is going on with our forklift back here is that these veins are stuck inside of this little transfer pump at the back of the pump. And basically we're not getting enough pressure coming through the metering valve into the shaft to push the pistons apart. So I'm hoping that we can crack this little transfer pump loose on the back of the pump and we might be able to see what's going on. If that's not the problem, then the issue is probably that these pistons are stuck and that's going to require us to tear the whole pump apart. Now there's also, I guess, a chance that there's a, there's a flexible coupling up here between this around the governor weight basket. That's a common failure on these Rusemaster pumps, but I don't think that would actually make it not start. It usually just makes them kind of run like crap. So we're going to start back here and see how far we get. So the big problem I've got right now is that this nut is actually rusted onto this line. So when I turn it, the whole thing comes with it. So I'll probably have to heat it a little bit. Well, maybe I got it. All right, I think we're good. Looks like it's been bent a little bit, maybe at one time or another. There we go. I'm gonna go ahead and say you probably shouldn't do this, which is to tear apart an injection pump 
in the field and then try to clean it on the dirty moss covered hood of a forklift but I'm gonna do it anyway I didn't find anything too scary just a little bit of crud on the veins I cleaned everything up I'm gonna jam it back together and we'll hope for the best I'm gonna go ahead and put a little smidge of grease on this on this little valve plate here just so it doesn't come zinging out of there while I'm trying to fight the thing into place okay I got the veins put back in the little impeller thing here and I put that o-ring back in hopefully that thing doesn't leak I don't know if that kind of silicone stuff is factory or that was some kind of a expedited field repair alright there's a roll pin in the back side of this cover that has to line up with a notch in the outside of that of that little impeller pump. Yeah, we might as well start with the hardest screw. So I'm gonna go pump the primer handle. We'll see if we can get some fuel here at this fitting. I won't be able to see it, so. You don't have to tell me how it turns out. Well, I'm still getting nowhere with this pump. I can't get anything out of the injection lines. So I went ahead and pulled the timing window off. And I don't know if you can see it in there, but I went ahead and lined up both timing marks. That'll make it a little bit easier to put the pump back on. And then, must have been off here a few times before, they've already got a, a mark scratched in the, the timing cover in the front of the pump housing. So that'll set our fine tune of the timing. Anyway. Go ahead and yank it off there. I can't get this return line loose, so I took it loose from the manifold and from the top. It runs all the way across the head and back to the tank. We'll have to just see if we can snake it out of there. Well, I've gone ahead and stripped the injection pump pretty much all the way down. This is the pumping section here, and this is that transfer pump area that we worked on in the field. So this ring right here is that cam ring I was talking about, and I believe it's directional. So you flip it around depending on which direction the pump rotates. Anyway, probably want to remember how that goes. So the way this works is this is the cam ring right here. These rollers are going to pop out against the inside of the cam ring here. And every time they hit one of these lobes, they're going to squeeze together. And there's two little pistons behind these little rollers that are going to squeeze together and create the high pressure fuel that goes out to the injectors. So if we pull these little rollers off, there's the little piston right inside there, and they are seized up. So this is a magnet. And a pretty strong one at that. Yeah, she's not coming out of there. So that's the problem, and the overall condition on the inside of this injection pump is horrible it's terrible dirty awful I don't think it would have run very good even if we had got it to run so it makes sense my dad was telling me that the way they used to start this machine was they put a 24 volt battery charger on it and just spin her over extra fast and that would be enough to push those pistons out and get the thing to run but we need to address this this is a major problem okay I got the pumping plungers out we'll set those aside for now everything's got to get clean so don't don't freak out about all this. Anyway, there's some problems in the advance mechanism. So this side here is kind of an adjustable spring and it seems to be okay. But this side here, I believe is the piston that should push the advance, the little advance deal. Where is that thing? This thing should push this to the side to advance the timing. And it seems to be kind of more or less corroded into one piece or sludged into one piece. This also I believe is supposed to be like a sliding washer on the top of here so that it kind of stays centered on this ball and it seems to also be corroded into one piece or sludged into one piece. There we go. 
So there's your little washer. It's supposed to be able to slide on top of this face. That was all sludged up. And then this thing, yeah, there it goes. Anyway, I'm gonna soak all this stuff and clean it up and we'll start putting it back together. Okay, my wife has locked the TV into one of those horrible hospital-based dramas, so I figure it's a good time to come out here and put this pump back together. I've got everything pretty much clean. Whatever this stuff is, this residue, this varnished up old fuel, it just laughs at the soldered solvent in my solvent tank. The only thing I really found that works on it is this CRC brake clean in the green can or regular carburetor cleaner. Seems to work pretty good. But yeah, like I said, the regular solvent doesn't do much. Anyway, this is the distributor head here. So inside here are all those ro rotary distributors. I did not take this apart. I'm not going to take this apart. I think the book even tells you not to monkey around with this thing. There's some magical stuff in here that you don't want to mess up. Like I think it tells you, you can't even touch the outside or the inside uh, rotor here. The tolerances are so tight on this stuff that it's, it's almost scary. In fact, it is scary. I've got some clean diesel fuel here. We're gonna use that as our lubrication as we start putting the parts back together. So I called my local injection shop and I bought a seal kit. This is it right here, genuine standardine parts. It's got all of our O-rings and seal washers and copper washers and all that jazz inside this little, little kit here. Now this injection pump has been apart before and they've already replaced this governor flyweight basket with the one piece basket design. So this is the most common failure point on a Ruza Master pump. Standardine has updated the design to this one piece unit here and I actually bought one because I need one for another pump that I'm going to have to get into but that's it right there. That's your part number, if you can read it, right there. And uh, there's your part number on the seal kit. This is a JDB pump, pretty common pump for you know ag or industrial applications. Now the one catch on these these one piece governor weight brack baskets is that they do not have the timing marks. So when you replace the basket, you have to transfer your timing mark from the old. Uh, basket ring and whoever installed this one piece basket has already done that for us and when I took the pump apart you saw I lined up those timing marks it's just a good idea to make sure that something doesn't happen with that little shaft coming out of the timing cover to make sure you don't get things all cattywampus anyway so I guess we'll get to it now, I want to stress that I am not some you know standardine factory trained service engineer with 40 years of experience on these pumps I'm just some guy on the internet, but I do have a service manual and a couple brain cells to rub together, so I don't think we're going to get in too much trouble. These really are pretty simple pumps. There's not that much as far as like calibration or anything that you could really mess up. So I made myself a map so that I can make sure I get these little plungers in the same side that they originally came out of. I don't know if that's important, but I want to do it anyway just because that's where they've been been running for all this time. So we'll lube these up and stick them back in. And the tolerances here are crazy tight. So right now, you see I can push this and both pistons move. That's just the air inside that bore causing those pistons to move. So it's actually such a tight fit that it's, it's actually airtight. Okay, we're supposed to set the, the maximum travel of these rollers by tightening this leaf spring. And there's a spec. So the tighter that you tighten this, the more it spreads and the more it allows these rollers to come apart. Okay, that's within one thousandth. I think that's close enough. I did put a little bit more of the blue Loctite on this screw before I installed it. So I think that we're gonna be good. Cross our fingers. All 
All right, we're going to install our one-piece governor weight retainer. And it has a little notch here, which is going to correspond with this little mark in the top of the rotor. So it's going to go on like so. Well, now's the part where springs go flying across the shop. So on this particular transfer pump housing, this, the single C has to be facing towards me. Okay, so we'll go ahead and put this end plate together. Just like we did out in the field. A little bit of grease to hold that thing together and then right here is the bore for the metering screw so we want the inlet to line up basically with that oh except I need my o-ring come on Wes wake up buddy Oh, 25 inch pounds. Okay, I've got to install this little pin for the timing advance. So this goes into that, that cam ring and that piston pushes on it to advance the timing. This is one of the stumbling blocks with a Rusamaster pump. It requires a special service tool and this is one right here. But all it really is is just a T45 Torx bit that's been ever so slightly ground down on the outside. So you can pretty easily make your own. In fact, this is one that I made right here. Just touched it on the bench grinder to take the outside points off of that, the Torx bit and away you go. Now you're supposed to replace this every time, but I'm not going to. Ours is in good condition, so we're going to put it back together. Okay, now it gets torqued to 35 foot-pounds. I'm going to go over to the bench vise and do that real quick. Okay, time for the rest of the timing advance mechanism here. There's a little disc 
that goes inside here and then there's an inner spring and an outer spring and the piston right here so that's the spring side and then this is the piston side and each one of them is going to get one of these little spherical washers and I'm just using a little bit of grease to hold that in place hopefully so the piston goes in from the side that has the drilled passage it runs basically out towards this hole where there's a check valve and it's also going to be marked with a single C and then the spring obviously comes in from the opposite side okay now we can install this little head locating bolt they call it okay then they want you to torque that to 300 inch pounds and you need a 7 16 12 point socket to do that all right we're going to install the metering valve in this bore right here i just want to make sure it's absolutely clean this metering valve goes into a super tight precision bore so you don't want to be you know jamming some bore brush or something down in there okay and it has a spring obviously that holds it up okay now the governor linkage So, all right, we're going to install the governor spring, but there's one thing we need to check before we do that. I don't know if you'll be able to see it on the camera. You see the governor arm there? It's got a little fork. It needs to fit down into a little notch on the end of the, the governor thrust mechanism there. It doesn't really say that in the book, but that's kind of an important thing. So you need to make sure you kind of reach down in there and align that the little plunger in the governor assembly so that it the groove matches up with the fork of the governor lever. And this is the governor spring assembly. So it's got the main spring and then there's this little uh, buffer spring at the back there. I think that's for the idle control some way. And then I installed a new aluminum ceiling spring on the governor guide rod here. Okay, throttle shaft time. So, let's see. Gotta have this thingamajigger in here like so. And this thingamajigger. All right, guys, I think we're pretty much there. I'm gonna go ahead and put the cover on. I tied the throttle back at full throttle. That'll put some pressure on that little governor fork there and help keep the, the fly weights in place. The shaft that goes in the end of the, of the pump here, the drive shaft, that actually helps hold that thrust sleeve for the, the governor flyweights. And without that, and without some pressure on this uh, little fork here, there's a chance that the, that the weights could actually fall out of that basket. So I'm just gonna tie it back for now and we'll go ahead and button this up. Okay, everything's back together. I stuck a screwdriver in the end and rotated that assembly around so that the timing marks are lined up now. I think we're ready to go ahead and put it back on the machine. I've got new umbrella seals. The only thing that kind of sucks, the kit does not come with a new O-ring for this mounting nose here. So I guess we're going to have to go ahead and reuse the old one, which is fine, I guess. Uh, there's a few things I didn't replace, so we have some extra parts here. There is a little square seal. This is it right here that goes underneath of the ring for the piston in the advance mechanism here. 
I didn't replace that. I didn't want to take a chance of breaking that ring, so I just left well enough alone. There's also a chance that this has a fuel delivery screw kind of in the back side of that shaft. I didn't take that out and mess with it. I'm not going to. So we're just going to have to let that ride. I think this thing here is a new seat for the fuel delivery valve. I don't even know if it has one, but I don't want to mess with that. So that's as far as I'm going to go. Let's put it back on the machine and see what happens. Okay, let's try it again. We'll throw the pump on and we'll hope for the best. Uh, hopefully we don't get shot. Today is the first day of shotgun deer hunting here in Illinois. And I know there's hunters in the area, but I forgot to bring my, my orange clothing. So we'll try to make a lot of noise. Okay, I think we're ready to stab this pump in here. Unfortunately, I tore one of these umbrella seals when I was putting it back together. See that right there? So I'm going to reuse one of the old seals, but it looks like it's in good condition, so I don't think we're going to have any problems. Oh, come on. Okay, now we got to try to sneak this umbrella seal in without rolling it. Got a little mirror. I just want to look at the bottom side of that seal and make sure, absolutely sure that we're not going to roll it. Okay, so it looks like our timing marks are lined up. Hopefully you guys can see that, maybe if I reflect a little light in there. And we're gonna line up our marks here on the, the timing cover, and everything should be good to go. I don't think there's enough room inside the timing cover for that gear to like skip a tooth, but that's my fear. That's why I wanted to line these marks up. The drive shaft will only go in one way. I'm pretty sure the key is offset, so it, it's only gonna go in one way. But yeah, that was my fear is that we might have in the process of wiggling the thing out, we might have jumped a tooth on the timing gears, but I don't think that's possible. I think the clearance is too tight. Anyway, it's just a good idea. Well, best we can figure, the fuel in that tank is 10 years old, and it smells like deck stain. Looks like crap, so we're gonna just drain it out into some buckets. I'll take it home, I'll, I'll burn it in my hot water pressure washer or something. It, it'll burn anything. Anyway, I, of course the tank's almost completely full. So I got two five gallon buckets, hopefully we'll get it all out of there. If we can't get it all out of there, we'll get as much as we can. And then we'll just dilute it down with some new fuel. We'll see if it'll run. If it'll run, we'll run it for a few minutes and then I'll change the fuel filter. Okay, why is that not working? It's like my siphon's got the same problem as that injection pump. Okay, let's try it again. These siphons are pretty cool. You just uh, shake it up and down. It's got a little check valve. And yeah, away you go. Looks like something you'd cook french fries in. That's as much as I can get out of it, so we'll just dilute it down with some clean fuel and see what we can do. I mean, really, it needs the whole tank cleaned out, but we can't do that today. Let's see if it'll run. All right, guys, we're getting somewhere. I filled the cavity with fuel through the return side here before I started, and then I bled the transfer pump section here by removing the, kind of loosening the outlet screw and using the hand primer. So I know we got fuel, and if I put the thing at full fuel here and crank it over, you should see a little bit of fuel come squirting out right here.
that's it. That little amount of fuel is our, our pulse to our injector. So all we gotta do is bleed the lines and we should be good to go. Well, I just about can't believe it. We've actually got fuel. <laughs> At the injectors. Well, here goes. We'll see if jump starting it helps. I should have plugged in the block heater. It's it's pretty cold. It's below freezing today, so we may not get it. Might have to come back tomorrow and plug it in. Well, let's see what happens here. Hope we got that on camera. I hooked it up 24 volt. I ran some jumper cables to my truck and just hooked it up 24 volt, give it a little more RPMs. That's all it needs. <sighs> okay, let's try that again. Well, we're gonna leave it here, I think. I've got plenty of, of footage here to put together a pretty good video, I think. It starts, it runs, but it's still got problems. It basically still has all the problems that it had before we started on this. So the only way I can get it started is to make it, to basically put 24 volt to it, to get it to spin over fast enough. And then once it's running, it, it runs okay at high RPMs, but it just runs out of fuel. So there's something wrong with the pump, the injection pump, I think. So I don't know what the problem is. I think there's an issue with the transfer pump section and we don't have enough transfer pump pressure or enough transfer pump flow. I don't know. I'll talk it over with my dad, but most likely what we're gonna have to do is pull the pump back off. I'll take it down to the injection shop and they can put it on a test stand and you know actually get a, some readings on it and figure out what's going on. You know, I'm at the limit of what I can do with the tools that I have, which is not that many. So it needs to go to a professional. So I probably should have gone to a professional in the first place, but I don't think we've heard anything. We just, we're not quite there. And that may have been an existing problem. I don't know, but something's not right. And it's beyond my ability to fix it. Also, I think we need to pull the starter motor off and take that to the starter motor guy and have him go through that because it just doesn't crank over like it should. That, that engine should spin over twice as fast as what it is. And it's not the battery. You can put all the battery you want on it. And it just will not crank over with the with 12 volts so anyway i guess we sort of accomplished what we set out to do which is to make it run but we got more work to do so anyway thanks guys for watching and i'll see you next time